In the next hour and a half, I'm going to be talking more about this methodology, but providing specific examples that many of you may run into as you try and get your applications to scale uh, to these huge machines. A lot of my talk will focus on, uh, on sort of the application type level. Uh, I'm not going to really talk about this system level anymore. We talked about upgrading hardware and going in and twiddling some of the knobs in the BIOS, uh, but many people won't have access to that sort of uh, level and that capability. So I'm going to uh, start at the application for the most part. And then the second half, I'll talk about tuning for the microarchitecture. I'll give a description of how we sort of model our architecture and what you should be looking for uh, when you want to do performance tuning for that. So uh, you know, when you do uh, tuning, I already mentioned, you want to do system and algorithm tuning before you dive down to the hardware. You want to make sure that you're usually utilizing the uh, you know, kind of uh, abstract resources like all of the CPUs and using the memory efficiency before you go down to the bare bones uh, metal tuning. In this presentation, I'm going to be using screenshots from our performance tool called VTune. Uh, but a lot of the concepts that I'll be talking about apply regardless of machine, specifically at that algorithm level. Uh, things like getting scalability on multi-core architectures. All the architectures are multi-core, and the issues that you run into are common. Uh, when we get down to the Intel tuning, I'll call it out and let you know, hey, now we're entering tuning for uh, you know, Intel microarchitecture. A couple of considerations to keep in your mind as you're doing performance tuning and as you're listening to this presentation, uh, there's no one-size-fits-all solution to algorithm performance tuning. Everyone's algorithm is going to have different requirements. You know what data needs to be computed when, when there's going to be conflicts on the data, that sort of thing. So you can learn the concepts here, but when applying it to your algorithm, obviously you're going to need to see how they fit. Uh, a lot of the changes in algorithm that are used to fix performance issues are incorporated into uh, fixes for common issues. What that means is when I start showing you how to detect you know, DRAM bound portions of your code, the fix for that might be to change your algorithm. Or when I start showing you, you know, how you're not getting parallelism on these cores, the fix for that is going to be change your algorithm. Uh, but there also are going to be cases where the fix is not change your algorithm. The fix might just be change the way the data is laid out. Use column major arrays instead of row major, that sort of thing. Uh, so just be aware that some of the issues that are detected can be fixed rather easily, uh, you know, sort of just by changing the way you're laying out your data or changing where you're implementing parallelism, that sort of thing. Uh, but a lot of them are going to uh, include algorithm changes. And obviously, you're going to need someone who's an expert in the algorithm, or at least has some knowledge about that uh, when you implement those performance tuning changes. And a couple of key uh, considerations. These have actually been talk, uh, touched on by a couple of the previous speakers as well. But when you're considering uh, implementing something and you want it to uh, run on these huge machines, and you're thinking about which way do you want the algorithm to be implemented, uh, always consider parallelizable and scalable over fast serial implementations. If you have the fastest serial implementation, uh, that's great. But if it cannot be parallelized, when you try and run it on a machine with even two cores or four cores, the, co the competitive algorithms that are parallelizable are obviously going to uh, you know, destroy your fastest serial algorithm. So think in your mind as you're implementing things, is this parallelizable? Where am I going to run into issues? How am I going to divide up my data? And don't think, how can I do this fastest in a serial manner? Because the way computing is going today, that's pretty much obsolete. Uh, we also, you know, I, I was amazed when James mentioned you know, the matrix multiply that did a little bit more computation and was faster. Uh, I have this bullet here where you compute a little bit more to save uh, memory and communication, right? Uh, the bottleneck in most architectures now is the communication and the memory. So it's not always a bad thing if you have to do a little bit more compute to save uh, the communication between threads or between nodes. So when you're implementing your algorithms as well, uh, think about the fact that I don't need to do the fewest number of flops. I don't need to just make sure that my uh, you know, assembly is the fewest number of assembly instructions. Yes, that's important, uh, but if you can decrease the amount of memory you're consuming and the communication required between the various tasks, that's generally much more valuable than uh, spending a little bit less compute. 
Uh, also think about data locality. Think about, uh, and, and this is an arrow to vectorization. When it comes to vectorization that James uh, talked about a bunch, if you uh, want to take advantage of that, it's important that the data you're operating on is nearby. Uh, you don't want to be doing gathers for every vector because you can really quickly eat up all the overhead of those vectorization instructions if you have to do a load for every element and the things are not being fetched on, on near cache lines. So always be thinking about data locality as well. Where am I putting my data? What other data is this data going to be interacting with? You know, whether it's in a vectorization sense or just a, a general sort of mathematical sense. And can I put that data laid out in memory in such a way that uh, you know, I can really minimize my memory overhead? Kind of the uh, low-hanging fruit when we get to the uh, algorithm tuning level I, I mentioned is compiler. Here's just a little bit more detail about the compiler switches that are most common for uh, performance tuning. Obviously, you guys are all probably familiar with you know, your generic optimization levels. You have this various O flags you can change. Each one of them uh, changes which flags are sent to the compiler. O0 is your lowest optimization turn off pretty much all of the optimization. And then as you increase that number, you know, O3 is the you know, most optimized, but it can also introduce kind of some idiosyncrasies in the code. And I'm not sure exactly on the guarantees that each one provides, but you want to make sure that as you change these optimization flags, you read about what they're actually doing and what kind of guarantees uh, are they changing. And sometimes guarantees can be violated depending on which, uh, you know, as you get to the higher levels of optimization. And for some people, it's the most important that your floating point calculation is reproducible. It never changes bit for bit reproducibility. For other people, if this thing is a little bit off and it runs 10 times faster or two times faster, that's fine. So that's going to affect how you play with these compiler switches. You know, you need to know what's most important to your algorithm and, uh, you know, test accordingly. Uh, vectorization done by the compiler. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, James talked about a lot of different ways that you can add vectorization at a high level, you know, SIMD, uh, IV depth, that sort of thing. But you also want to make sure that the uh, compiler knows which architecture are you targeting. So our Haswell architecture, for example, has AVX2 instruction support, which is a 256-bit uh, register. And if you compile with something targeting uh, hardware that only supports SSE, it's not going to generate instructions for that Haswell machine. And there's a lot of different ways you can tweak these flags. Xhost says compile for the machine that I'm compiling on, uh, which you guys may or may not be you know, using. But you can also put a list of these things that says compile with AVX instructions and have an SSE fallback so that people who uh, you know, are running my code on a machine that doesn't support AVX, there will be SSE instructions. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways you can generate uh, vector instructions. But I, I showed you that screenshot where we looked at the assembly in a tool as well. That's a way you can verify exactly what kind of vectorization instructions are being generated. Not just vectorization instructions are being generated, but AVX instructions or AVX2 instructions, that sort of thing. Uh, there is you know, uh, inter interprocedural optimization. This is going to look at you know, a cross-function boundary, see if optimizations can be applied at that level. Uh, Profile-guided optimization is going to profile your code, generate a report that the compiler will then use in its next comp compilation uh, to optimize. For example, it'll put the hot functions that call each other next to each other in the binary, that sort of thing. Uh, dash fast is a uh, kind of a grouping of several other uh, flags, and you can read about what each one of those does. And dash parallel for the auto parallel parallelization that James mentioned, which sometimes works, but oftentimes you don't get a whole lot depending on your application. Uh, if you use a compiler intelligently, uh, you can get a lot of performance gain very cheaply. If you haven't done anything to your compiler, to your make file for performance, uh, this is definitely something you probably want to look at. If you're very familiar with compilers and you've played with all these flags, maybe there's not a lot left. Uh, but some people can get a lot of performance if they haven't thought about the compiler. Uh, you can consider using uh, just the hot libraries and the hot routines uh, changing your compiler flags. You don't have to compile the whole program with all of these flags. You know, most compilers support binary compatibility between them, and you can just compile one file with some of these optimizations and all the other ones uh, with other optimizations. Uh, check the documentation for you know, what each of these flags mean. 
And obviously, we have people that can talk about compilers all day. So I'm not going to go into too much more detail about this. But be aware of the fact that a compiler can do a lot of performance optimization for you. Uh, this table is from the Intel compiler, uh, but there's a lot of other similar flags on your other standard compilers. Uh, MPI tuning. So this is specifically talking about the MPI communication layer between your code. If you guys have MPI applications, uh, great, you've taken advantage of multiple nodes, but have you done it efficiently? And there's a lot you need to think about uh, when you're considering how many nodes do you want to run on, how many ranks per node, that sort of thing. Uh, you need to know how much time is being spent inside the MPI library. That's what we're talking about here with uh, MPI bound. If you're doing blocking calls and you're doing them inefficiently, uh, it doesn't really matter that you've added MPI because a lot of your time is going to be spent waiting for the available data. You you'd like to get an idea of uh, what's the breakdown of time spent in MPI code and time spent in non-MPI code. You know, we kind of call this core bound code or uh, compute code, that sort of thing. Uh, and this tool, Intel Trace Analyzer and Collector, does that analysis for you. Uh, it tells you, you know, what MPI functions are you spending the most time in, and it actually has a new feature that gives you advice about very common uh, performance issues in MPI codes. So it'll give you kind of a, a plain text readout of, we found this issue, here's some of the common things that you can do to fix that kind of issue. It also has a, uh, what they call the idealizer, where basically it says, if we were to remove all of the compute from your application, how long would it still take, right? If you did all that compute super efficiently in parallel, it took zero seconds, how much time is spent in MPI, right? And you can do the opposite. If all of the MPI happened instantaneously, how much time would this take? So you get an idea of, am I really bottlenecked by poor MPI communication, or am I bottlenecked by the hardware and my compute time? Ideally, you know, you'd be bottlenecked by the hardware and the compute time. The MPI communication would be as little as, you know, as possible. But in order to take advantage of nodes, you're always going to have some overhead from MPI. Yeah? So what's the key difference between this analyzer and the total view? And total view? I couldn't tell you. I'm not an expert on total view. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah? Would, would this uh, support using asynchronous data transfers? Yes, it does. Yep. So that's, you know, specifically looking at your MPI communication and your MPI overhead. I had a screenshot from ITAC in the introduction uh, that I took out of this section uh, because I wasn't sure how the time was going to work out. Uh, but it has a timeline basically showing you exactly when a receive happened, when was the data from the send that was coming to that available. And you can see you know, how well is my communication going and uh, where are the areas where th threads are basically spinning idle waiting for data. Uh, next, I want to talk about to talk some of the about common scaling, scaling barriers, barriers, barriers that people run into. People run into. Yeah. Uh, what's the typical overhead introduced by you know, using these tools? So it, it, vary, it varies depending on what type of analysis you want to do. Uh, but I'll just say in general, the performance analysis tools try to be as low overhead as possible, you know, a few percent if, if, at most. Um, because when you perturb or run, you're not getting valid performance characteristics, right? And so things like MPI or like ITAC, basically they do instrumentation of MPI calls. So the more MPI calls you have, you know, if every other function calls an MPI call, you're going to have higher overhead. If you're doing an MPI call very rarely, there's no overhead during the other portion of the application. So it is dependent on that, but that's the way it works. For the uh, hardware event-based sampling that I'll talk about at the end, that's extremely low overhead. Uh, basically, that's count that there's registers on the hardware that uh, are counting these events, and every so often, infrequently, an interrupt is fired and a little bit of information is collected. Uh, but the overhead is, is nothing like a debugger or something like that. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're at 10% overhead from a performance tool, the, the, the performance state is not really valid anymore. You know? I'm just curious in terms of flags that you are going to use for uh, when you compile the code and then to run the tool. Mm -hmm. uh, should you try different combinations of flags and uh, try to see what you get from the tool? Or definitely you should go with just dash or three and then inspect the code with that one? Or uh, what is the uh, sort of the recommended practice? So if you, if you 
If you're okay with the guarantees that O3 gives you, there's a lot of loose guarantees with O3. Some of the changes, you know, might break things a little bit. Uh, you can definitely try that first. And if if you're happy with what's created, there's, you know, the other O the other O levels are going to be worse than that for the most part. Um, I don't know that there's an exact science as far as the order to throw the flags. A lot of times things won't really give you anything, like the like the uh, auto parallelize or the perf uh, performance guided optimization. Those are things to sort of try in conjunction with other flags. Uh, as far as when you want to use a tool, the only thing we say about the flags is, you know, you settle on your flags, whatever you're getting the best performance with, and then we recommend you add the dash G flag for symbols because we correlate the performance data back to source code. I'm not sure if that answered your question exactly, but but yeah, so with the optimization flags, if you're going in and deconstructing what O2 is and picking and choosing various ones from that, that's a pretty low level compiler type of, type of optimization. I would generally just start with those O levels and maybe if you're interested in some of the other ones that I had up there. And if there's one flag in the O3 that, you know, chain, that it doesn't have guarantees about loop interchanges or something like that that won't work with your code, then you could deconstruct it and just put all the flags except that one. Uh, but then you'd have to look a little bit closer into what each of those optimization levels do. And it's going to be different for every compiler. So IBM's O3 is going to be different than Intel's O3. Yeah. So this is, is, is mostly talking about uh, at the node level. Uh, this is talking about taking advantage of all the cores on a single node. Uh, I added this yesterday after uh, the gentleman talked and said, if you reserve a node, Right? Even if you don't use the cores, you're still paying for them. So if you reserve a node with 32 cores and your application uh, only has 16 threads, you still paid for those nodes, so you should use those cores. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of reasons that the single node performance in an MPI process, which is probably what a lot of guys uh, or a lot of people in this room are going to be doing, don't scale to that many uh, to that many cores. And if you're just doing strictly MPI, where there's one process per node, and you can, or one process per core, and you can put as many as you want on a node, then you should be able to take advantage of all the cores. But that's not always the best way to take advantage of cores. Uh, there's an OpenMP, MPI kind of hybrid model that generally, uh, in a lot of applications, can work better on a per node basis. You might have four MPI processes per node with four OpenMP threads each or something like that. And there's trade-offs between using OpenMP and MPI, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, but now I'm going to talk about some really common issues that people run into that uh, blocks them from scaling on a single node. Uh, the first is static thread scheduling, which is, well, I don't know, like, I'm not exactly sure how familiar people in here are with multi-threading and OpenMP and things like that. Uh, but this, to some people, might seem like a really a uh, basic issue that no one should ever run into. But as we heard earlier, uh, with legacy codes, this does happen. People hard code numbers into their uh, applications to target a specific architecture, and for some reason, they never thought, hey, this is going to run on a bigger machine later. Right? So hopefully, uh, you, know, you, you understand that core counts are trending higher. Designs should always consider future hardware. Uh, and this is commonly found in applications that you know, are kind of legacy applications programmed by someone that didn't attend this course, right? Uh, so what do you see here? Obviously, this guy has said, oh, I'm going to break this into four even chunks, no matter what, and that's how I want to uh, implement parallelism on this machine. So I've got some sort of macro defined. Usually, it's not this close to where the loop is. But you know, somewhere, someone's defined a macro saying, here's how much scalability I have. And here, they're doing a pthread create. Uh, to create that number of threads. And this ran really well on their four core machine. Right? They were super happy with the performance that they got. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that doesn't scale. So what you need to do is you need to make sure that you're creating threads dynamically. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. But you want to identify the hardware you're on and take advantage of it right? without having to pass that in as a parameter or do some sort of you know, uh, you know, manual check. All, there's a lot of different ways you can do this through library codes. OpenMP, for example, 
generally takes advantage of this automatically. It looks at how many cores are on the machine and you know, it uses all of them. There's a lot of you know, variance in that statement, but for the most part, writing in some sort of library language like OpenMP or TBB or Silk Plus uh, will take advantage of scalability like this. So if you have an application uh, that's got you know, static thread scheduling in it, rule number one is get rid of that. It's not going to work on the next generation. It's not going to work on coprocessors. Uh, it's not going to work you know, moving forward. So any sort of static thread scheduling that you have or static decomposition of the problem uh, can really hurt your scalability. The second issue that we heard this term quite a bit throughout the day uh, is load imbalance. What load imbalance is, is when you've decomposed your, your uh, problem, perhaps dynamically, but you've broken it up into eight pieces of, and that's the entire iteration space, and you've given the work to your eight different cores, and uh, one of them finishes, oops, one of them finishes way before everybody else, and there's no more work, right? So great, you used all the cores, but you didn't use them 100% of the time. Uh, what you need to do is have some sort of workload distribution so that when a thread finishes its work, it's able to grab more work from the queue or steal work from an already existing thread so that all the threads can stay busy all the time until all the work is done, right? And detecting something like a load imbalance is not easy from you know, command line and printf and top and that sort of thing that I showed earlier. You really do need some sort of tool to help you see that, yes, you took advantage of all the cores, but halfway through, one thread stopped. 75% of the way through, another thread stopped, and they never started up again, right? And the way that you fix load imbalance is through using some sort of library that does uh, you know, task stealing and task decomposition. If you're familiar with OpenMP and you've ever written in an OpenMP parallel for loop, you can do a schedule static or a schedule dynamic. A schedule static will break it up into chunks, farm it off, and then everyone will work on their chunk until they're done. Uh, whereas dynamic will make smaller chunks, feed those off to the threads, and when one finishes, there's another chunk for it to grab. Right? So that's just a really quick way to do dynamic scheduling that can help with load imbalance issues. And if you're detecting load imbalance, you want to figure out, you know, am I doing some sort of static partitioning? I hit on most of this already, uh, but basically, yeah, you want to use some sort of threading model that does auto load balancing. Uh, and for all of these things, you can do this stuff manually, but just like we said with libraries, it's so valuable to find someone that already did it. The same with threading paradigms. Yes, you can go in and create all your P threads manually and do all of your load balancing manually, but you're probably not going to do it as well as people who do it as their full-time job, right? So uh, if you have the option to use some sort of library that does load balancing, definitely take advantage of it. Uh, you might see the terms like task stealing, dynamic uh, scheduling. Those are all sort of things that can take advantage of load balancing. Yeah? Question about the dynamic scale. <laughs> when you pair that with um, the data parallelism, so like the SIMD construct, mm -hmm. um, what, what, what do you observe? And on one hand, I'm thinking that the static decomposition with bigger chunks would be better for the data parallelism. So the, the thing about data parallelism versus ta task parallelism is the amount of data you're working with uh, is orders of magnitude larger for task parallelism. The overhead for creating a task versus the overhead of doing a vector instruction instead of 16 scalar instructions is very different. So when you're breaking up a matrix, uh, say you're breaking it up into eight threads versus 16 threads. Uh, if it's a large enough matrix, uh, the vectorization should happen so many times, whether you're on eight threads or 16 threads, that you're not losing the vectorization performance by breaking it up into those small pieces. In order to affect your vectorization performance by breaking it up into more threads, uh, your threads would have to be so small that you shouldn't have broke it up into that many threads in the first place. Does that make sense? And because of, you know, core counts are in the order of 60, 100, 200, uh, vector instructions, you should be doing thousands of them. Uh, you're probably not going to hurt your vectorization, start, you know, eating away at its performance just by adding more threads. I guess absent of adding more threads, I'm, I'm thinking of the dynamic versus the static scheduling. Uh, for vectorization? Yes. So vectorization is basically going to be uh, 
Okay, so let's, let's think about this. There's a few different things that I can think of. If you have static scheduling where you're not taking advantage of all the cores, each core has its own vector processing unit. So by letting those sit idle, you're losing the performance of using them and using their vector processing units. Uh, if you were to, I guess I'm not really sure what, uh, what, what the exact question is. <laughs> Right, so, so, so there's really no, so, so, so in my mind, dynamic is always better than static, and vectorization is kind of unrelated. You should have vectorization, whether you're static or dynamic, uh, and if you go to a dynamic scheduling versus a, vec, uh, versus a static scheduling, you shouldn't overload your vector units because the cores that those threads would have been running are sitting idle anyway, so those vector units are also sitting idle. Now, if you were to do some sort of dynamic scheduling that were to oversubscribe, so now you've got four threads on a core, there's not that many vector units. They can't all have, you know, there's going to be back pressure on the vector unit. Uh, the third very common uh, kind of pitfall of doing uh, parallelism is something called lot contention. Anyone in here who's done OpenMP or any sort of thread level parallelism should be aware of the fact that all of those threads operate in a shared memory space, right? What that means is they all have the same virtual memory addresses, and when one thread goes to, you know, address 106 and does a write, another thread's address 106 is that same data, right? There's no MPI, explicit communication between the threads. All of them work in a shared memory space. So the implications of that, while there is a performance benefit because you don't have to explicitly send data between the two, you have to do synchronization between the threads to make sure that they don't muck up each other's data. Right? That's something called a race condition. If you have two threads writing to a data location without any synchronization, uh, it's non-deterministic what's going to happen you know, after those two writes occur. So in order to get rid of that, you use synchronization. And kind of a very common term used with synchronization is a lock. Say you had a shared, data, a shared piece of data. One thread locks it, does its access, and then unlocks it. Another thread locks it. Does, and when you lock it, no other thread can get access to it, as long as they're also acquiring that lock, right? So that's the way that you do synchronization. But if you do that, uh, you know, it's a necessary component of multi-threaded applications. Uh, but if you do it poorly, you can blow away all of the performance that you would have gotten. You can essentially serialize your program if you have a, a really coarse grain lock that everyone's trying to get access to. So what you need to do is do some analysis of your synchronization and see how much performance impact it's having on your application. That's what I'm calling uh, lock contention here. If a lot of threads are contending for the same lock and a lot of threads are having to wait because it's always being acquired by someone else, then you can lose all of the parallelism that you would have otherwise had. So you need to determine what kind of granularity uh, you want for your lock contention. Uh, here I'm showing uh, a metric we calculate called wait time. Basically, any time a thread tries to acquire a lock but can't because another thread has it, we start incrementing the wait time. Uh, and then you can see you know, how much time were threads spent waiting for something uh, that they were trying to share with someone else. Uh, you can also see for every lock in my program, generally you'll have different locks for different pieces of data, which one was the most contentious. And uh, you know, some tools, including ours, has the ability to drill down into source code and tell you exactly how much time was spent waiting for a lock. So here I've got a line, a pthread mutex lock. That's a, that's a pthread API to acquire a lock. And 103 seconds was spent between all of my threads waiting on that lock. So obviously, you know, I'm leaving a lot of performance on the table. Those threads aren't doing anything while they're waiting for this lock. So that's something you definitely want to be aware of uh, when you have multi-threaded applications. Uh, some solutions for the lock contention problem uh, is choosing your lock granularity very intelligently. Uh, what that means is, imagine you have a huge array that everyone accesses. One way to lock that array is to lock the whole thing. Anytime someone accesses anything, there's a lock uh, around that whole array and no one can access anything else. Right? If all your program does is access that array, you've serialized it. Right? No, all the threads are just going to be waiting for each other on that array. Another option is to lock every element of that array individually. You know, in order to access array number, uh, element number one, there's a lock for that. There's a different lock for element number two. There's a different lock for element number three. And locking is not free. 
When you lock an element, that takes cycles, that takes instructions. And so if the chances are that no one was ever going to conflict with you because it was such a fine-grained uh, locking scheme, then again, you've really added a lot of overhead. So there's no one solution for lock granularity, but you need to consider, you know, where do I get the best performance? I need to protect my data, but I don't need to protect it too much, right? Uh, there's also a lot of library solutions that we'll keep hammering on that use lock-free or thread-safe uh, data structures, so all of the locking occurs under the hood. This doesn't necessarily get rid of all of the uh, lock contention issues, but when you start thinking about adding locks in general, uh, some of these have very efficient locking structures in them, uh, and also using things like local storage and reductions that are built into you know, OpenMP can uh, help you with lock contention. Okay, so that is my uh, spiel on algorithm tuning and some of the common issues that people run into, uh, both at the MPI and application level. Uh, most of the rest of my talk is going to talk about microarchitectural tuning. This is the architecture track. I'm from Intel. We're an architecture company. So uh, I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit about uh, you know, my, Intel's microarchitecture. But a lot of the concepts, again, although they might not apply or be available on other architectures, uh, they are you know, kind of common across many architectures. Uh, so what is microarchitectural tuning? This is tuning specifically for the Intel microarchitecture. Tuning specifically to take advantage of the way we've laid out the transistors on the chip, of the way we've implemented new features on the chip, uh, that sort of thing. And a lot of the solutions to these microarchitectural specific tunings, although the data that drives them will be based on Intel's architecture, a lot of the changes will apply uh, performance gains on other architectures as well. So as we've no seen, we're in a hierarchy, right? So we, we started with the system, we went down to the application, and that's the biggest bang for the buck, the next biggest bang for the buck. Uh, the PMU microarchitectural tuning is when you think you've got a pretty good application. It's scaling. It's, take it's parallel, right? It's definitely got to be parallel before you get here. It's taking advantage of all the cores. It's got MPI in the case of you know, cluster applications. But you still want more performance. You still want to make each process, each thread run faster. Then you start looking at how am I using the hardware and what can be done more efficiently. You know, this isn't going to give you a 10x speed up like parallelism or 100x speed up like MPI on clusters. This is going to give you percentages of speed up. You know, depending on how bad your application is and how well you can fix it, you know, yeah, you, you might get a 2x speed up or something like that. But this is, this is low level stuff. This is realigning your data so that it gets to L1 cache instead of L2 cache. Right? That's not a 10x speed up unless all you're doing is accessing those caches. Uh, so, so, I talk, so that's when you'd want to do this. Uh, if you decide you do want to do this, particularly you do want to do this on Intel architecture, go get the tuning guide for your system. We write a tuning guide. Uh, it's based on VTune, but you don't need VTune to get use out of this tuning guide. And it's designed specifically for the hardware you're on. So when I say hardware, I mean Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge Server, Ivy Bridge, Ivy Bridge Server, Haswell, you know, in the future Haswell Server. The, hardware changes on each one of those platforms. And you don't want to be the guy that has to read the 600-page developer's manual on that platform every time it comes out. We read that for you, and we tell you what's important and put it in these tuning guides. Uh, so every architecture changes, and we don't want you to have to be an architecture expert in order to do microarchitectural tuning. We try to keep things as consistent as possible, but when it comes time to decide how many transistors are going on each chip and the higher ups are deciding what events are we able to count and what events are we not able to count, it changes between platforms. So we abstract that away for you and uh, you know, we try and keep it as consistent as possible, but we don't want you to worry about that. So we abstract that away. Uh, and then where you should start with microarchitectural micro tuning is called the top-down methodology. Uh, I mentioned that briefly earlier and that's what I'm going to be going into. Uh, but that is what we deem to be the most efficient and most straightforward way to do tuning on uh, Intel platforms. This is integrated into the tuning guides that you can get for free from this website. It's also integrated into VTune, which is our performance profiler. Uh, and this will all hopefully make a little bit more sense as I go through the future slides. <laughs> 
I had this slide earlier, but I kind of had to rush through it, so I want to make sure it's clear how you do microarchitectural tuning. And the major you know, thing that you're using is what's called a performance monitoring unit, a PMU register on the Intel chips. Uh, these are you know, real transistors existing on the real silicon, and they count events. They count things like instructions retired, cache misses, branch predictions. Every time uh, a hardware event occurs, you, know, you program this PMU and you say, here's what I want to count, and then it counts it. There isn't a PMU for every event. There's only a few. So you can only account a few events at a time. Uh, but we, we hide that from you and abstract that from you. Uh, but just be aware that there's not one PMU for cache misses and one PMU for branch mispredict. There's hundreds of events you can count on these platforms. It's not feasible to have hundreds of registers to count them. So you program them and you uh, count the events that you're interested in. They can be counted or sampled. So what counting means is you say, I want to count this event, start, stop. How many were there? And you read the register and it says there were 65 million cache misses. That's useful for some people. That's useful if you want to just get an idea of what the system is doing in general. But it's not particularly useful for software tuning because you have no idea where those cache misses occurred, you know, what was causing them, that sort of thing. The other way you can collect events is through something called event-based sampling. Uh, these are sampled events. And what that does is, you know, you say every 20,000 cache misses, fire an interrupt and tell me what the instruction pointer was. And I can correlate that all the way back to source code and tell you what lines of source code, what assembly level instructions are causing cache misses, what assembly level branches are being mispredicted. And then that's the real value in microarchitectural tuning is knowing where it's happening in the code. Uh, raw event counts, which is what you'd see in, you know, if, if you just wrote your own driver or if you were to use some tools, uh, are very difficult to interpret. I'm, I said this exact phrase earlier, but if I were to tell you you had 65 million cache misses, what does that mean? Is that good? Is that bad? You know, uh, but by uh, listening to hardware performance tuning experts and using tools, you can get useful metrics. Tools like VTune and Perf uh, both have metrics based on these uh, events. So uh, I haven't talked a whole lot about specific architecture, but you know, here's a picture of some architecture. If you're really interested, this is an older uh, VTune, or sorry, an older Intel Core, and it's not by a long shot got everything that's on the core, uh, but it's conceptual. And to make sure we're all on the same page for doing hardware tuning, I'm going to go over a couple of hardware definitions. Uh, on the core, you have uh, something we call the front end. The, and, and you know the Intel core and all the other cores pretty much are divided into pipelines, right? You have various stages that the instructions go through until they're retired at the end. And by doing some uh, you know, super scalar processing, you can fill that pipeline up and get instruction level parallelism. Uh, but one piece of that pipeline is called the front end. Uh, the front end is in charge of fetching the program code, uh, which is like your x86 assembly from the binary. Uh, decoding them into low-level hardware operations called UOPs or micro-ops. So each assembly instruction may get coded into one or more micro-op that's going to be fed through the pipeline. Uh, the UOPs are then fed to the back end of the pipeline through a process that we call allocation, and that term will come up a little bit more uh, in this performance tuning. Uh, and the most important thing to know is that the front end can allocate four micro-ops per cycle. Right? So it's not just one instruction per cycle that can be done. Uh, you can actually do four micro-ops per cycle in the ideal case on an Intel processor. The back end of the processor is in charge of monitoring when a micro-ops data operands are available. Right? So if I need to add two numbers, I need to make sure those numbers are available. Uh, it executes them in one of the available execution ports. So the execution ports can do different things, and there's multiple execution ports. Uh, each, each iteration of the hardware is going to have a different number of ports and different things that each port can do. And then when a UOP is completed, uh, this is called retirement, where the actual result of the operation is stored back to the uh, program state. Right? So that's in a process called retirement. And the back end has the capability to, to retire four micro-ops per cycle. So in a, in a whizzing pipeline, we could be allocating four micro-ops per cycle and retiring four micro-ops per cycle. And then we introduce this one abstract term called a pipeline slot, which is essential to understanding the top-down methodology. And the pipeline slot represents the hardware resources needed to process one micro-op. 
So what that means is modern big core Intel pipelines or Intel processors have four pipeline slots available per cycle. So they can allocate four UOPS per cycle and they can retire four UOPS per cycle. So essentially they have the hardware available in the best case scenario uh, to do four UOPS per cycle. So we say they have four pipeline slots available per cycle. And where we're gonna go from here is we're going to try and figure out how efficiently are we using these pipeline slots, the term that we've introduced, where are we using them inefficiently and why? Right, so this is, this is really key to the understanding of tuning for Intel microarchitecture. Knowing what hardware is available and then we're gonna try and classify its use. Right, so if you, if you imagined a program that ran serially for a million cycles, there's four million pipeline slots that you wanna classify. There was one every cycle that could have done something, or there's four every cycle, it was a million cycles, so let's classify those. And how do you classify those? Uh, the way that you classify them is into one of exactly four categories. We're classifying pipeline slots here. Uh, and the way that all of this is done is through the use of events, counting those events in the PMUs. But you don't need to know that. You don't need to know what events are we counting. You don't need to know what metrics are we using to classify them into these four categories. It's useful to know that that's how we're doing it, but we've abstracted away the fact that we're counting these three events, you know, and that's how we classify these. Uh, but what you do using events, uh, what we do automatically through the use of metrics, is break down each pipeline slot on each cycle uh, into one of four categories. And how do we do that? Uh, the first thing we do is we say, was a micro-op allocated into this pipeline slot? If yes, did that micro-op ever retire? If it did, then that pipeline slot on that cycle is a retiring pipeline slot. Did this micro-op ever retire? No then that pipeline slot on that cycle is a bad speculation pipeline slot. How does that happen? Well, there's a lot of ways that can happen. The most common is we have branch predictors that say, I think this is going to be a taken branch. Let me start executing those instructions. Uh, then when the branch actually occurs, it turns out it's not taken. All those instructions that were executed were wrong. You have to flush those out of the pipeline, and that was basically wasted work. Uh, also, if you get you know, machine clears, that sort of thing that flushes the pipeline, you'll get bad speculation uh, pipeline slots. Uh, the other branch at the high level is you're looking at a pipeline slot on a cycle, and you say, was a micro-op allocated to this pipeline slot? No, it wasn't. Was the back end stalled at this, uh, at this cycle? Is that the reason something was not allocated? If so, then you're a back-end bound pipeline slot, meaning nothing was allocated because the back-end was bound, uh, the back-end was stalled. And the last case is nothing was allocated, was the back-end stalled? No, then you're front-end bound. The reason something wasn't allocated is because the front-end, for whatever reason, couldn't get the UOP. Okay, and, and I'm just gonna keep drilling on this, so if this doesn't quite make sense, hopefully it will. Yeah. Can you explain the front-end bound and back-end bound uh, why, this occurs? why this occurs? Sure. Yep, so I'll, I'll have some examples, but I'll give you the most common ones. So front-end bound is generally related to instruction fetch. If you are on a, uh, it's basically if your uh, next instruction that you need cannot be fetched efficiently, then even though the back end was ready for instructions, the front end didn't have time to fetch one. So a lot of times virtual machines, interpreted codes, that sort of thing, the instructions aren't right next to each other in memory. So those can have uh, a lot of front end bound issues. Um, I'm trying to think of some other common examples, long jumps, that sort of thing. If your code is jumping all over the place and it's not able to fill the iCache efficiently, you can get front end bound issues. Uh, those are a lot less common. The most common issue is back end bound. Uh, back end bound is when either you're bound by memory, that's gonna be considered back end bound, or you're bound by compute. So if you're doing a lot of memory accesses and a bunch of stuff is waiting, then the back end is going to be stalled. It can't take any more instructions from the front end because it hasn't executed the instructions it has because it's waiting for memory. That's the most common back end bound issue. You can also get core bound issues in the back end. For example, if you're doing a bunch of divides in a row and there's only one divider port or two divider ports, you and it takes a long time to do those divides, then you're going to be core bound in the back end and uh, you know, you're gonna wanna know about that and you can look at the assembly. So that's 
That's, that's the most basic overview of what the front end bound and the back end bound are caused by. And then underneath each of these, these are the top four categories, which are the, uh, you know, these are the heart of the top down characterization. But there's probably 50 submetrics and sub submetrics that break down these categories even further. But these top four categories are, you know, the way that you calculate the pipeline or you characterize the pipeline slots. Uh, so a couple bullet points to shore up your understanding. Uh, the top-down characterization is used to determine the hardware bottleneck in an application. Uh, the sum of these four metrics will be one, because what you're looking at is the percentage of total pipeline slots in each of those four categories. Uh, this is the core of the top-down characterization on Intel hardware. There's more metrics uh, in, in various tools that each of these can be broken down into, uh, but these top, but but those can change across platforms. From Sandy Bridge on, these four categories can be calculated on all of our platforms using various events. Uh, what's underneath those changes depending on the platform. There's a white paper available online here, and I think you guys will get the slides, so don't bother trying to white, write that down. But it describes this in in uh, very uh, you know very simple terms, but also a lot of detail about this top-down characterization. So if you have time. Uh, definitely check it out. So if you were to go and download a tuning guide uh, or look on a lot of Intel's documentation, uh, we give you an idea of what percentage various applications should expect to find themselves in for each of these categories. A lot of you are probably going to be over here in the HPC uh, realm, but we also have uh, you know, sort of ranges. And you can see that these are very wide ranges. The retiring category is actually kind of the best category, right? If you find yourself retiring a lot, that's good. For these other categories, being high in them is bad. For retiring, being high is good. Um, and obviously, these are very wide ranges. And your application you know, will vary. But you can see most people find a lot of time back end bound very little time in bad speculation. And then outside of these ranges is where you want to start trying to identify what's causing me to be outside of that range on this microarchitecture. What can I do to get myself back in that range? And you can also do comparisons across multiple runs. Even if you're in this range and you're 30% back end bound and you make a performance change and now you're 25% back end bound, that's good. Even if you're 30 and now you're 35, oh yeah, you're still in that range, but that's a negative performance impact. So these ranges are kind of guidelines just because people wouldn't know where to start when they saw those percentages. But we've analyzed lots of workloads in the wild and sort of come up with these very wide ranges. Another thing you want to do uh, when you're doing this microarchitectural tuning, before you even drill down into those various uh, bottleneck regions, is determine some metric of efficiency. And there's a couple of ways uh, you can do this using events. Uh, the two most common are what I'm going to go over here. One is retiring pipeline slots. So here, uh, this is a screenshot from VTune. Uh, it's, it's calculated using events, but you know, there's other, other ways to get this data. Uh, here you can see you know, this function, 31% retiring. You know, this function, 34% retiring. This function, 17% retiring. And that gives you an idea of how efficient you are. And it's also a good point to compare uh, once you make changes, see how the retiring percentage changes. The other efficiency metric that people are probably uh, maybe a little bit more familiar with but didn't realize that it's kind of an event-based metric, even if you've been using it for a long time, is something called CPI or IPC. Cycles per instruction or instructions per cycle. You know, they're reciprocals. Uh, but on an Intel machine, I said, in an ideal case, we could do four instructions per cycle, right? So what's that make our ideal CPI? 0.25, right? Uh, cycles per instruction, one quarter. So looking at this metric uh, gives you an idea of efficiency as well. But neither of them tell the full story. If you start adding instructions that take longer but do more work, your CPI can go up, but your overall runtime can still go down. So none of these are an exact metric that says how well you're doing. They're things to be mindful of and things to watch uh, as they change and try and figure out, you know, why did that change? Is that good? In the end, for most people, wall clock time is what matters, right? Uh, but these are, if you, if you were to actually decompose CPI, what you would have is you would have an event that counts instructions retired. It would be something like 65 billion instructions retired. And you'd have an event that counts clock ticks, how many ticks of the actual 
you know, crystal oscillator on the chip, you know, 65 billion, well then you have a CPI of one. It's just one divided by the other. And that's what a metric is, combining events into a useful number instead of just looking at the raw counts. So let's start looking at some actual issues uh, and how they would appear if you were to use the top-down tuning uh, methodology. In this case, you know, my screenshots again are from VTune, but Linux Perf has these metrics built in. I was talking with someone at lunch. There's actually people at Intel in the open source group that work with Linux Perf uh, you know, as a lot of their job to get things like this built in so that people can use this without being tied down to you know, the VTune tool. Uh, it doesn't have quite the GUI that VTune does, but microarchitectural tuning, this is Intel specific, so people that aren't interested in Intel hardware aren't going to spend a lot of time in implementing these metrics, right? Uh, so here, let's look. Here we've got a, uh, a profile that was done where I collected the needed events. And here you can see this is what a raw event count looks like, just for your reference. Here's the uh, clock ticks event. Here's the instructions retired event. Here's the CPI, which is just those two combined. And it's, on, it's for this function. These are all functions, because that's how I grouped it. And then you can see the breakdown into these various four categories that I talked about. Here we're 35% back-end bound in this calc force function. And VTune actually has thresholds built in that will highlight pink if you're outside of a predefined range that our experts have determined. So let's investigate what's going on here in this calculate force function. And how do you investigate? Uh, well, there's a lot of uh, hover text and documentation built in. And all of these metrics can be expanded. right? So I, I expanded the back end bound category. Underneath, there's a memory bound category and a core bound category that I talked about. Under the core bound, there's a port utilization category. And I can see that there's a lot of cycles where three or more ports are being utilized. Now, that's not uh, immediately obvious what that means, if that's good or that's bad. But by hovering and, and using documentation and learning what that actually means, uh, you can learn about each one of the metrics, how are they defined. And here's an example of a threshold that's used to calculate whether this is an issue. All these things that you see with all caps, those are uh, raw event names. So this is UOPS executed cycles with greater than or equal to three UOPS executed. This is the kind of thing that we're trying to abstract away from you. So you don't need to know what those mean. Uh, but basically what's going on here is we're hammering the compute hardware. We've got ports that are, you know, yes, there's more adders than there are vector units, you know, from a port perspective, uh, but uh, they can't do nearly as much. So we're basically hammering the compute hardware here. So we want to know, are we vectorizing, right? Uh, the next thing we can do is double click on this function. And now I've actually got the source code right next to the assembly code. I can see, oh, all my time is being spent on these lines of source code. What assembly is being generated uh, from that source code? Here I've got an SSE instruction, and I was running on a Haswell machine, right? So not sure if you know this or not, but Haswell can support uh, AVX. So this is not a good instruction to be using on a Haswell machine. I'm not taking advantage of the full uh, vector width. How can I fix this? Well, I know. Uh, a flag such as xhost can generate more efficient uh, vector instructions for a Haswell machine. So that's what I did. Uh, I generated AVX2 on Haswell using the uh, xhost flag. Now I can see, look at these assembly instructions. They're different. Those are AVX2 instructions. And unfortunately, there's no hover text that you hover over that and it says, this is AVX2. But they're very uh, easy to uh, decode. There's very uh, small differences between them that make it obvious to tell what kind of vector instruction it is. And here's a metric of wall clock time called elapsed time. It was 15 seconds before. I just did an X host flag, and now it's 10 seconds, right? So that sort of thing you wouldn't necessarily know. You might even know from the vector port, you know, there's various levels, but that it was vectorized. But you might not know that it was vectorized to AVX2 or it was vectorized to SSE or that sort of thing. Uh, so that's what we're talking about with microarchitectural tuning. And that's just uh, one example. Yeah. Does the code compiler always use some stats for X-host? So X-host will compile for the machine that the compiler is running on. So if you're compiling on that MacBook and trying to run on a cluster, it's a different architecture. But there's ways you can use the compiler to generate various paths. You can say AVX2 and SSE, and it automatically puts the fallback in there 
and it'll detect, does this CPU support AVX2? If not, I'm going to go on the SSE fallback or something like that. So Xhost actually isn't something many of you would probably in the room use, depending on where your compiler's located and where you actually deploy the software. But when I'm on my laptop, that's what I use. Uh, but there's flags for every generation of vector instruction. So let's look at another uh, issue. This is a memory bound issue. That last one was a core bound issue. Here, again, I'm looking at a, uh, a multiply function. Uh, it was 97% back end bound. That's terrible, right? What's going on here? Uh, if I drill down under back end bound, I can see 74% you know, DRAM bound, meaning 74% of the time I'm stalled waiting for accesses to DRAM, right? And I'm going to show you. You know that you guys will probably all laugh at the person who implemented this, but uh, you know this person wrote their own matrix multiply, and they're addressing arrays, uh, large arrays, in sort of a, a column major order, which is not the way it's laid out in memory. Right? You should be accessing a cache line one after another. Here, it's jumping from a cache line to 256 cache lines later to 200. You know, so the way they've laid out their memory, that's the problem, and they'll get the right answer. You know, and they won't know that this is taking longer than it needs to unless they do this type of microarchitectural analysis. You don't know how well you're utilizing the caches until you start looking at the caches. Uh, so in this particular issue, all you have to do is a simple loop interchange. Uh, so, so, so what would you do, right? So you'd look at this. You'd say, OK, I'm back end bound. Now what? This is a screenshot from the tuning guide. Uh, I provided you guys a, links, a link. And it talks about all of these metrics you know, what can cause them and what are some things uh, to do about it. So in this case, I'm looking at the uh, DRAM bound. Uh, it's called LLC miss on some other architectures. Uh, but this is a DRAM bound metric. You know, change your algorithm to reduce data storage, uh, block the data to fit into the cache, uh, align data for vectorization. So basically what's happening is, uh, you know, you're missing in the cache way too often. So I went in and I made a simple loop interchange uh, to changed the way those arrays were addressed. And now it's only 57% back end bound. It was 97%. It's still highlighted, which means there might be room for improvement. Uh, but that's a big performance impact by seeing how well I'm utilizing the caches and you know, making a little change. If you guys are doing a lot of you know, computation, which it sounds like most people probably are, you know, hopefully you're using a library. And hopefully your library has been tuned for this sort of thing. But uh, a lot of libraries haven't gotten down to this low level tuning. Intel libraries generally have because you know, we're intimately related with the hardware. But uh, this sort of thing can really you know, hide itself without the use of a tool. You really don't know what's going on at this sort of level without the use of some sort of microarchitectural analysis. Uh, so this is an example of doing a NUMA analysis with uh, microarchitectural events. NUMA, basically, for anyone that's not familiar, is uh, non-uniform memory. I'm not sure if the A is accesses or uh, something. But uh, essentially, when you have uh, a multi-socket system and each socket is attached to memory, uh, it's still a, you know, a shared memory space. But accessing the memory that's attached to a different socket is much more expensive than accessing the memory that's attached to your own socket. For the most part, you have to go through the other core to get to that memory. Uh, there's some forwarding and things related to that. But because this is a shared memory space, a lot of applications and libraries don't know where the memory is being laid out. And if things are laid out on the remote memory, you, know, you can have uh, a performance impact from that that you might not be able to detect. Right? So, uh, what do you want to do is you want to use processor events that can detect these sort of memory access patterns. How often are you accessing remote memory? How often are you accessing local memory? You know, what sort of impact? Not just how often are you doing it, but how is it impacting the performance of your application? These metrics that are built up here, they're generally not just, oh, you're doing it 100,000 times or any sort of metric like that. They're generally, there's this many stalls because of remote memory accesses. A stall is a real thing where the pipeline is not busy because of this remote memory access. Just knowing the number of remote memory accesses, if the superscalar processor can fill it in with a bunch of other uh, instructions while you're waiting for that memory, then it doesn't really matter that you had to go to the remote memory location because the cores were still busy while you were waiting. So uh, the top-down analysis is trying to find the real bottleneck that's, calling, that's causing your application to stall. 
It's not just trying to tell you what's happening. It's trying to tell you what are the performance implications of what's happening. Uh, so after that little tangent, NUMA analysis, right? Uh, so multi-socket systems have uh, you know, memory uh, attached to each socket. And depending on how your memory is laid out, you can really get a performance ding if you do it inefficiently. There's different ways to tune for NUMA and to see what's going on. Uh, one way is VTune, as shown here. There's some ways to control NUMA priority with uh, some of these kind of built-in Linux functions here that can say, hey, I want to lay things out you know, uh, in this way, or I, I, I want you know, first touch to be allocation, or that sort of thing. Uh, the two metrics that are currently built into VTune are called remote DRAM and remote cache. So it'll tell you uh, what is the performance impact of accessing remote DRAM, meaning DRAM that's not attached to the socket I'm currently executing on, and what is the uh, impact of accessing remote cache. So it's a shared memory, so the caches are all coherent, and if the data is stored, if the most recent modified data is in the cache of the other socket, getting that data to your cache is still expensive because you have to go you know, a long distance relatively uh, to move that data. So we have metrics related to both remote uh, memory accesses and remote DRAM accesses. Uh, and if you see that you're having an issue there, then what? Uh, well, then you want to look at you know, where is memory being allocated and where is it being accessed? This issue has mostly gone away for a lot of people, but you know, on some, of, some older systems, uh, it would be the person who does the allocation uh, that the actual memory is allocated on that socket. If you're the person that calls malloc, it'll be allocated on that socket. Whereas in a lot of new systems, it's actually the first person to read that data or the first person to write that data, which is generally, you know, it depends on your application, but that's generally what you want. A lot of people have one thread do all the allocation, but then that thread's no longer going to access any of that stuff. So you'd want to make sure that the threads were actually doing the accesses had the data on their NUMA socket, right? So that's, that's one thing to consider. Uh, temporal locality, uh, basically that just means if you can access the data now and, 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 and keep accessing it until you're done with it uh, temporally, then it's going to stay hot in your cache. It's not going to get pushed out to the other NUMA socket. And then when you want to get it back, you have to bring it all the way from over there. If you bring it into your cache once and you keep using it and no one else has invalidated your cache line, uh, then you, know, you won't have to incur that NUMA penalty over and over again if it gets kicked out all the way back to the other socket. Memory bandwidth. Using the PMUs, I showed this slide earlier, but there's events on Intel hardware that allow you to actually, you know, uh, at a hardware level, determine what's the memory bandwidth, not just kind of guessing. And I think, for example, you know, the stream benchmark uses some of these things to calculate memory bandwidth. This is low level, right? This isn't hand wavy, oh, I think it was about this much because my array was this big, you know, that sort of thing. Here you're using events and you know, you know, every time a memory request occurs, that's a eight byte transfer or a 64 byte transfer. You multiply that by the number of events that occurred and you can get the real memory bandwidth of an application. And, you know, with a lot of tools, what you'd get is at the end, you'd get, okay, there was an average memory bandwidth of, you know, 45 gigabytes per second or whatever. And, uh, what does that really mean? Well, it could have been a sustained 45. It could have been none and then a huge you know, spike and then none and then a huge spike. And if you don't have this sort of temporal view of it, uh, you don't get an idea of where the memory bottleneck really was. So what you want to do is you know, not just know the overall average memory bandwidth, because you know, averages don't really mean too much when it can go up and down. Um, but do some sort of analysis to see the actual temporal behavior of your memory bandwidth. And then where you see spikes, uh, do a zoom and actually see during that exact you know, period of time what functions were active. And that'll give you a good idea of what functions were actually causing this memory bandwidth to explode, not just the fact, oh, it did explode, but I don't know what to do about it. Uh, again, I mentioned knowing the theoretical peak of your bandwidth. Uh, because this, uh, this chart here is scaled to whatever the max measured was, not what the theoretical peak was. So you can get an idea of whether you're accessing the theoretical peak uh, if you've done that calculation. Another thing you want to look for is uh, high LLC misses. LLC is your last level cache. So in most current Intel processors, that's the L3. Once you miss in the L3 cache, 
that's when you have to start going to memory and going to those DRAM sticks and bringing it in, which is very expensive. And the events that count LLC misses will have instruction pointers tied to them. And it'll say, here's the line in your Fortran program that has a lot of LLC misses. You know, and that's where you want to focus if you want to decrease your memory bandwidth or your memory accesses. Uh, there's also events in recent uh, processors to calculate QPI bandwidth. QPI is what's used to connect the sockets together. So as information travels between the two sockets, even if it doesn't go to memory, it goes across the QPI, and there's a limited bandwidth there as well. So you can see if that's the bottleneck in your application. A couple more examples from the tuning guides. Uh, data sharing. Data sharing occurs when uh, you have data that's on a cache line. Uh, you know, two pieces of data on a cache line that multiple threads are accessing, which invalidates it in one cache uh, in order to move it to another cache. And there's events you can use to detect whether uh, data sharing is occurring in your application. You can tell whether the data that's being shared between multiple caches has been modified, meaning that it's real data sharing. And then there's also events uh, that you can use to tell whether or not it's uh, false sharing. If you have two pieces of data on a cache line, uh, everything's done at a cache line boundary. So if one core writes to one piece of data and another core writes to a piece, a piece of data on that same cache line, that invalidates that line in the first cache and it has to be moved to the other cache and it'll ping pong back and forth. Even though they're not sharing the specific byte that they're writing, if it's on the same cache line, uh, that can cause performance impacts. And so some of the things you can do about that is adding padding. Right? So when you lay out like a struct, if you just say int, 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 a lot of times those will be right next to each other in memory and on the same cache line. You can, you can do various, you know, there's various ways to do padding to make sure that things are not on the same cache line. You can pad things to make sure that they're on the beginning of a cache line. Uh, so you know, this is just an example of one of the issues that can be detected with microarchitectural tuning that I pulled out of the tuning guide. Uh, I have this slide on uh, front end. Uh, front-end bound metrics. This would be under the front-end bound category. There's a metric called front-end latency. Uh, this is related to, you know, how often are you, uh, you know, uh, not executing any, uh, any instructions. There's a front-end bandwidth and a front-end latency. Bandwidth is when you're, when you're allocating some. Latency is when you're allocating none. And I already mentioned some of the reasons that this can uh, happen. You know, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, VMs or interpreted code, whether you have profile guided optimization that can help when it lays out things in your binary close together. If it knows jump targets, uh, it can, you know, make sure that instruction fetch happens more efficiently, uh, giving hints about branch prediction, that sort of thing. Uh, so there's, you know, these are just examples from the tuning guide, and I don't have time to go through all of them, uh, but each one is called out. How would you observe it? what can cause it, and what are some things you can do uh, to make it better. A lot of the things I've been talking about were related to uh, Xeon, meaning our you know, big core server platforms. Uh, but this stuff also applies to Xeon Phi uh, in a slightly different way. So Xeon Phi is an Intel architecture, right? You've heard a lot about it today already. But Xeon Phi has these PMU units as well. And tuning for Xeon Phi is different than tuning for Xeon. Uh, it's got huge vector units, right? You want to make sure you're using those vector units. It's not made for serial performance. So we have a tuning guide specific for Xeon Phi uh, for tuning at this microarchitectural level. Uh, if you were to uh, look at, you know, VTune, it also has uh, hover text, just like it did for Xeon, related to all of the metrics, which are different metrics for Xeon Phi. These are the important metrics for Xeon Phi, which are different than the important metrics for Xeon. One example uh, of the Xeon Phi metric is an efficiency metric that uh, determines compute to data access ratio. So this is a coprocessor. It's very limited by memory. Uh, it's got a lot of compute power in its vectorization units. But uh, you, know, you want to make sure that you're using those. Every time you read from memory, hopefully you're doing a lot of compute to make it worth it. Uh, so there's an event called VPU elements active, an event called uh, VPU instructions executed. And by looking at that, you get what we call the vectorization intensity. Uh, and that's actually a really useful metric. So the way that that works is when you do vector instructions, you have something called a mask. Uh, 
where you can say, okay, I want to use all 16 lanes of the register in both vectors, and the result will be 16 lanes wide. You can also put masking registers in there and says, okay, I'm only using the first, the third, the fifth, and the ninth lane. The other ones actually don't have the data to be calculated in them. And then you're kind of getting a lighter uh, you know, vector uh, instruction. and Not lighter in instruction power, but lighter in uh, you know, the actual performance that you're getting. And that's what the elements active is, is it's saying how many things were not masked off and how many instructions were executed. So for example, if you were doing, I always get these numbers wrong, but let's say you were doing, uh, you know, single precision uh, and you could do 16 of those per cycle uh, and uh, every instruction was doing that. There was no masking, everything was 16, then your vectorization intensity would be 16. And you know that you're actually using those vector units, right? You're actually using all the lanes all the time. If you were to be thinking that you were doing AVX 512, but really you're masking off half the register every time, and you're doing single precision where you could be doing 16, and this vectorization intensity metric turned out to be 8, then you'd say, hey, I thought that I was doing, you know, 16. Uh, elements every site, every instruction, but really, uh, apparently, I'm not, and there's a lot of different reasons for that. Maybe it's your memory layout, maybe it's you know something else. But then you need to look and see whether that vectorization intensity is what you would expect it to be. Uh, there's also ratios and thresholds designed for uh, compute to data accesses. So the L1 cache compute to data access ratio. You know, you want to be doing uh, more compute then you are doing L1 data access, and you want to be doing even more compute than you're doing L2 data accesses, because those are exp more expensive than L1 data accesses, right? So it's, it says it's you know, 100x uh, for the threshold for L2 compute to data access. And these things are calculated with events, so again, you can correlate this all the way back to source code. You can say, where's my L2 accesses? What line of source code is it? Uh, let's correlate it all the way back, uh, and then I can try and change my code. But here you've got you know, 16 for single precision, 8 if you're doing double precision. Uh, and then if you start falling below that, uh, there's some tuning suggestions. Using the compiler vectorization report to determine how well things are being vectorized. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of pragmas that James already talked about. Data alignment uh, for vectorization, if you have data all over the place and you're trying to bring it into a single vector, it's very expensive. If you can just grab things that are uh, contiguous in memory and bring them into a vector, it's obviously a lot, uh, a lot cheaper. For example, they say, you know, using uh, array of structures and changing it to structure of array, that sort of thing. Those are the changes that really affect uh, whether something is vectorizable. You know, overall, pretty much what I've said today, performance optimization methodology, uh, you know, follow the performance optimization process. Don't just hunt and peck and pray and, you know, hope that you can find what the problem is. Use tools, uh, use, you know, go for the low-hanging fruit first. Make sure you're utilizing the resources. Uh, do this iteratively, build it into your, uh, you know, build it into your regular process of uh, development. Don't just do this as a second-class citizen. And do this scientifically. Don't just, you know, uh, kind of guess at something. Uh, actually take notes, actually, you know, Keep track of what you've done, how it affected the performance, uh, and make hypotheses. How would I expect this to affect the performance? If I'm parallelizing on a four-core machine, I'd like to see this section speed up by 4x or 3.8x. Maybe not the whole code, but this section. And if it doesn't, why not? You know, look into it. So practice. That's why that guy rode in on the bicycle. And use the right tools uh, as well. Uh, when it comes to selecting tools, hopefully some of you have been convinced that tools are necessary for performance profiling, uh, but there's a lot of different tools you have to choose from. There's really simple, fast tools like Linux Perf and sampling. Uh, these are very low overhead, uh, but then again, also sometimes the granularity that you want isn't there. If you want detailed call stacks and more information, the overhead grows. Uh, and some of these are implemented uh, in the OS, like Linux Perf, uh, or you know, sort of at a very low level. Uh, the PMUs on the chip obviously are part of the silicon. Uh, but then there's very complicated uh, you know, ways to do performance analysis also. Some of these probably aren't so applicable to you guys, but you know, there's simulators that actually simulate the entire machine. You can lockstep through every instruction and see what's going to happen. Uh, you know, there's 
tools at the application and platform level, a lot of the screenshots I showed you know, were application level type tools. Whether the sampling or instrumentation is done at the low level, you know, it's abstracted in such a way that makes it easy for developers uh, to use. Uh, the consideration here is always overhead versus level of detail, and it's often a trade-off. As you want more and more detail, there's gonna be a little bit more overhead. Uh, so you need to determine for yourself, how much overhead am I willing to accept and how much detail do I really want? One thing that you can do is you can run a really low overhead collector to get sort of a profile, and then run a higher one and kind of disregard the actual runtime, but use the information that comes out of it in a correlation with the previous run thing that says, okay, now I know a little bit more detail about what was really happening when that thing ran, even though the wall clock time isn't really a legitimate representation. You know, a couple, Takeaways that you should keep in mind, none of these tools provide exact results. If you want exact results, you have to use something like a simulator that locksteps through every assembly level instruction, and obviously that's not going to give you performance, that's just going to give you what happened, right? So this is all done statistically with sampling or instrumentation or something like that, uh, but when it comes to performance tuning, this is not correctness checking, proving, you know, uh, proving that something is correct or anything like that. This is just getting results like engineers do, right? We want it to run faster. So we don't need uh, everything to be exactly as precise uh, as some of these sort of debugging and correctness checking tools need to be. Obviously, uh, these things try to be as low overhead as possible, as I mentioned. Statistical theory applies here. The amount of samples that you take needs to be enough to represent your application. So uh, I'm not gonna get into that too much, but there's a lot of different uh, things to note when you're doing event-based sampling. For short runs, you need to make sure you're getting enough samples. Uh, you know, think of the sampling frequency, the length of the data collection, and the number of experiments you want to do. Uh, for these big clusters where they're very low weight OS kernels, some of this stuff probably won't apply. But if you're running on something else that has a lot of stuff running in the background, you know, always take note of whether there's some heavyweight processes going on that could affect the performance because the system's all tied together. If somebody else is taking up a CPU, that's not one you should be expecting that you're going to be able to take advantage of. Uh, start early, tune often, and uh, the last slide I have is just an aggregation of the links I've shown throughout the day. Uh, and you guys will get these slides, so you'll get these links as well. Uh, and that's all. So there's a little bit of time for questions. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned trying to, <coughs> a strategy to avoid full sharing in some cases is to try and pad um, memory around a, an entry that you're concerned or know is a problem with full sharing. Is there a way to do that in a way that utilizes the compiler's knowledge about the cache line width rather than relying on the human to know how big caches to are? Uh, so the question is, is there a way to rely on the compiler or some other, you know, uh, technique so that you don't need to worry about how big to pad cache lines. Uh, so in the recent forever, cache lines have been 64 bytes, right? Um, I don't, and as with data alignment, I don't know that we have any sort of generic alignment. Usually you align at 128 or you align at 64. James, do you know if there's any generic way to align? Cache line sizes don't change. They've been 64 bytes for a really long time. Um, and I don't, I haven't heard anything about them changing, but having said that, we've harped on abstraction today forever, and that's one thing that I don't know of an abstraction. So uh, there's two, the, the TBB memory allocation library does alignment to prevent false sharing, and that uh, can be set when it's ported to, to the right number. Otherwise, I've seen users, you can use the align directives and attributes. I've seen people define those as a macro and a header file and then just, uh, set the alignment to avoid this. Any other questions? Yes. So we have all these nice hardware patterns for, for telling what the CPU is doing. Uh, but I've been interested lately in, in what the network is really doing and uh, trying to have some sort of performance tool that can tell me, uh, OK, so this MPI run, first it took this long in latency, and then it sent this message. And, sent this message on this particular wire machine, uh, those sorts of things. So as far as this particular wire of the machine, I'm not aware of anything. Um, the ITAC tool that I talked about does sort of your generic 
network modeling of saying this this message was sent from this rank to this rank, and hopefully somewhere in there you know which which CPUs those were on. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, the trouble is like on some of these machines, there's this like dynamic routing of messages. You really have no idea, like just knowing that it went from this rank to this rank tells you nothing about how it got there. Yeah, so from Intel's perspective, at least as far as you know, what I do in my day job, we design the core and you know some other things. I don't know that we have much insight into like the network card or how things are routed, um, and I'm not aware of tools that do, unless you have something to add, James. But uh, from our perspective, we don't have that insight. Yeah. Anything else? So I'm aware of it. if you're using MPI, there's stuff like um, MPIP. Okay. Profiling uh, to see what your load balancing and such is like between your MPI communication. Okay, so he mentioned a tool called MPIP, which uh, can do some load balancing and communication analysis as well.